Hey, power people. Welcome to Renewable Rides, powered by Vector. I'm Gareth Evans, the CEO and founder. And I'm Dan Roberts, head of sales. In each episode, we'll uncover the latest trends, learnings, challenges, and triumphs relating to the energy transition, on-site energy, and sustainability through the experiences of our inspiring guests and team here at Vector. So get ready for an exhilarating adventure into the fast-paced world of challenging limits, adapting purposely, and empowering co-creation to accelerate the energy transition with those that are on a mission to create a more resilient, profitable, sustainable, and thriving energy future. So let's go. All right, power people, and welcome back to another episode of Renewable Rides. And today, Dan and I are very excited to be joined by James Coombs, who's the founder and director of Painted Rock Capital. Um, He's got incredible experiences that we'll dig into with respect to financing solar and storage applications for commercial and industrial businesses, and a a great background, working for SunPower, um, Rec Solar, and many others. And you know, as a follow-on from our last podcast, which was demystifying your utility bill, we get a lot of questions about how do we finance energy systems? Like, what are my options? Where do I, where do I begin? Um, what's the best approach for me? And we're going to unwrap that across the next few episodes with James. So uh, welcome, James. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's funny, I was thinking about it as we were talking before the the show here, you said making energy fun. And for me, it's like, that's one of the reasons why you know, I love what I do. Um, After having been in infrastructure finance for, you know, basically three decades, to do solar projects, where you can actually drive out and see the project or take your family out and show them the project and go out and talk to the people who are actually building stuff is, is really what's so so fun about this. So uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I love doing what I do and always enjoy talking to you guys. James, you I'm going to start off by just giving us a quick intro into who you are and your background and how, you, uh, how you've how you become an expert in financing these awesome systems. Yeah. Um, so here's what's relevant. And with the preface that, you know, expertise is one of those things, especially in this environment that, uh, you know, let's use the term cautiously with, uh, as we're recording this here, fall of 2023, you know, interest rates are going up. What some people will say is unprecedented. And those of us who have been in The market for a few decades will say, yeah, this happens. Uh, And with that, it changes not just the cost of capital, but what kind of risk appetite do lenders have? What kind of structures do people want to participate in? Who's participating in the market? uh, And all that. So it's unprecedented and yet precedented times that we can talk about. I've been financing infrastructure for since 1993, so so 30 years. And uh, I started in telecom finance uh, for a decade doing uh, M&A and uh, high yield, at least as we call it at the time, high yield finance for uh, a lot of cable uh, cable television companies. I'm not sure if people know what that is anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and who turned into broadband companies. So we did a bunch of infrastructure financings in the mid 90s. And then a lot of M&A deals when companies that you now know, like Comcast and uh, and others bought up a bunch of small family owned companies that you never would have heard of, like Resident Communications and Booth Communications. So we went from sort of driving around in the wilderness of Michigan and Nebraska financing systems to sitting in New York and Denver when big companies bought them up. And I highlight that just because I think the relevance of infrastructure finance when you're talking about solar and energy is we're doing long-lived assets that require you know, longer-term financing, both for cost-effectiveness uh, and flexibility. Um, you don't want to have to refinance a 25-year asset every five years. Uh, it's nice to get, and that's what we can do with solar, is really uh, getting things where they're cash flow positive for customers. That's why your prior segment on understanding and demystifying your utility bill is the perfect kind of lead-in to this. As I always say, that's the baton until you understand how is solar going to reduce your bill you can't really think about how much it's going to cost you to finance because you don't have that perspective. So goal here today and talking about these for me would be to make sure people understand how what we're doing pairs up with that utility savings analysis work that you guys have already talked about. 
Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, excited to have you here, James. So, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, specifically within the the solar and and uh, and and energy space, distributed energy space. Um, some of the projects or or uh, uh, things that you've worked on. Yeah. Um, and I skipped over talking about more of my background because I like to get into the content, uh, but relevant, I guess, is to say that uh, I started in solar uh, through actually a partner and good friend from long ago, Ryan Park, who brought me in at REC Solar. So we were a contractor. I worked on the contractor side for three or four years. I transitioned from REC to SunPower. So I worked on the vendor side for three to four years. Uh, then I had a PACE, uh, or sorry, a PPA fund that ended up combining with Technology Credit Corporation um, and then transitioned from that to doing PACE financing. So I like to think of it as across the sort of spectrum from building things to supply to finance. I've kind of existed at all parts of the food chain. Uh, and that informs a lot of things we do, you know, financing, especially in the kind of early part of the development stage. And we'll really talk about kind of development because there are so many uh, stages in the process that you go through. And if you're not thinking about the later stages, I guess maybe that's a takeaway, particularly for customers and contractors is if you're not thinking about what's going to happen over the course of the process in those initial inception moments, then you sign up for, you know, challenges along the way. So one thing I highlight is, Financing isn't just about getting the lowest number on paper, but it's also about thinking, hey, who's that partner? You know, how am I going to contract with them? How am I going to get paid? How are all those things going to happen? When you've worked on the contractor side, you know, you have an expectation of how you're going to build a project, contract it, and get paid. But then when you're working with different types of lenders and investors, well, they also have their requirements you know, hey, we're going to balance how much we give you in the earlier stages when there might even be some risk whether the project can proceed based on permitting. Um, we've seen what happens. I'm sitting there, you know, seeing what happens when you develop a project and you're about ready to start building and the investor says, hey, actually, I need you to change a few things. You know, it's not the sort of standard operating process you're used to kind of going through. And so just to say that, having existed at different stages of this, what we're always trying to do is create good chemistry between the customer, the contractor, and the lender or investor. Sometimes we use those terms interchangeably, but let's just say the investor, uh, to make sure everybody's expectations, requirements, timeframes all kind of sync up. Uh, and so that's what everything we do, we're really focused on creating that, that mix so everybody goes in with good expectations. So James, I'm a commercial or industrial business leader. I'm seeing my energy costs going up. I'm starting to wonder what my options are. I've either worked with Vector or someone else, and I've seen that solar or storage or multiple other technologies are going to be advantageous to me in terms of running my business. I want to go and deploy it. What are my financing options? What should I be thinking about? Um, yeah, this is a great kind of setting up the menu um, and, you know, in every menu, there are some things that you're going to like and they're going to be right for you. And there are other things that will call them options on the menu, but they may not really be options for you based on your specific requirements. And so um, right off the bat, the one I'll highlight, and I'm sure you guys get this a lot, is are we talking to the owner of the real property? And we can break that out in a few ways. So I'll just highlight that if you're talking with a pure tenant, okay, even if it's a tenant with a long-term lease, if you're not actually the entity that owns the property, then it highlights a few considerations. One is, you know, do you want to be making these kind of tenant improvements? And two, from a financing standpoint, who am I really underwriting? And do I have, you know, as part of my underwriting, whether you call it collateral or not, uh, real assets. Um, and so there are some even in that exceptions in that. There was a project going around maybe a decade ago for a large investment grade athletic gear manufacturer that had a long-term lease. And I said, look, for an A-rated company, I mean, we'll do almost anything. If they terminate that lease, you know, we're sure they'll pay, you know, the buyouts or pay the loan off or whatever it is. But in concept, you know, we see a lot of restaurants and things like that, where it's like they don't own the property. That's just a very hard. We just, I was just talking with a startup, um, even a solar related startup, but they don't own the property. And it's just going to be really hard to finance something like that. 
Uh, but I distinguish that from a situation when we just have a lot of you know, individuals or companies that have simply separated their real estate assets from their operating businesses for tax and operations and other purposes. And that's fine. And in fact, not only is that fine, but I would highlight that, you know, you can often kind of decide between the two, you know, hey, who wants to be the counterparty for this financing? Um, and so again, this is all under the subheading of, are we talking with who owns the real property? But if I've set up, uh, so I have an operating business, we'll call it Opco, and an ownership business, we'll call it Propco, um, because they rhyme. And I like alliteration. Um, we could really finance kind of ultimately the property company. But if you needed to, say, have the operating company own the system for purposes of monetizing the investment tax credit, then we can structure something that way. Uh, so it gives you actually a lot of flexibility, but the key aspect there, and this is for any of the lenders in any of, whether it's our investors and lenders or others you're talking to, it's really gonna come down to, do you own the real property? And in the course of 15 years, I could probably still list on you know one hand, the number of situations where we've deviated from something, uh, from something like that for some reason, whether it was an investment grade customer or I did a great project for the Santa Maria Humane Society, where the city owned the land, but they had a long-term lease with this private nonprofit. So, you know, we can work around there, but we ultimately had the owners of the real property somehow engaged in the process. But to highlight, this does not mean, and I have probably never seen the owner say, I will finance something where I have 100% of the liability and none of the benefit. So it's really just about kind of aligning, uh, even in those situations. And if you have just straight up property ownership, again, that's the number one question we're looking at. So uh, let me pause there. Did that trigger any follow-up uh, questions as I went deep there? So if I own my facility, um, what what options do I have for financing an energy system? And then if I once you've answered that, if I don't own it and I have someone who owns a building, what conversations should I be having to try and yeah. figure out whether they'll be supportive? Yeah. So we'll focus on the first part of that because the reality is if the building owner, if you have an owner tenant situation, we have said some where the owners want to do a project that will ultimately benefit their tenants, but they're planning on charging their tenants for that benefit. Then the conversation may originate with the tenant, but we really need to shift it over so we're talking with the building owner. So to answer the rest of the question, starting from that point. So the next question that I think is worthwhile to ask, and this presumes that at some point, you know, they're gonna you have a good developer that's gonna come in and do the utility bill analysis and everything else. If we kind of from the aerial image, we know we have a site that's probably suitable for solar. The next question I focus on in the discussion is the tax credit, because depending on the owner's federal income tax liability, they're either going to be highly motivated to absorb the credit directly, because along with the credit, and we can break into this if you guys want in this section or in the next one, is also going to be the substantial depreciation benefit where you're purchasing this long-lived asset that federal tax law allows you to depreciate very rapidly. So in addition to just that 30% or possibly 40% tax credit, there's also the significant depreciation benefit. If you're paying federal taxes, then you're going to want to do everything you can to retain ownership and monetize those benefits directly. But I want to quickly follow on and say, if you are not, and a large percentage of our customers, if you look at, uh, for example, the uh, when I was at Technology Credit Corporation, which was our PPA fund, creditcorp.com, we have probably 20 or 30 projects profiled on the site. You'll notice that all of those are nonprofits and municipal entities who don't pay federal taxes. You know, hey, James, doesn't that contradict what you just said? No, here's the key transition is so much of solar finance, commercial solar finance is built around incorporating tax credit monetization, tax credit absorption by the investor along with the provision of financing. So, you know, those of us who live in the industry are probably even saying, hey, that's redundant, but we do it so much we take it for granted when you sit down with customers who haven't done this before. These are really two separate questions. 
And so I like to say, let's identify, do you need capital for your project? Say we have a million dollar project. You know, are you looking to source a million dollars of capital? Okay, that's one question. Are you looking to absorb the better part of 30% or more investment tax credit? That's a second question. Or do you really need both? Because we can do one without the other. We can finance the system without absorbing the tax credit for you, or we could monetize the tax credit for you without financing the rest of the system. A lot of real estate developers are going to be in that situation where they have new build or existing build. They have secured facilities. In fact, a lot of them have you know, FHA rates that are going to be extremely low. We're not going to bring you better than your federally subsidized, you know, senior rates. But, but particularly if they're, you know, most are structuring and funding these through, you know, standalone LLCs, special purpose entities, they don't have any effective ability to monetize the tax credit. So we can just do that piece of things for you. Or we bring those together in the structure that lots of people are waiting for me to say power purchase agreements, PPAs, uh, or leases, uh, tax leases or operating leases, depending on your terminology, where we can do both provide the, the capital and finance uh, the tax credit. So that key question is, how does the customer think about their federal tax liability is a really key early stage question to get down. I run all the time where I show people both options. Yep. Uh, and there are other, uh, there are certainly a lot of customers. Uh, for example, I mean, if you look back at Walmarts and Kohl's and a lot of the big chains, uh, they did all of their projects with PPAs. And you'd say, well, look, Walmart and Kohl's play, pay tenny, plenty, the pay plenty of federal taxes. Why did they do that? You know, there are other benefits when you get into a PPA scenario in particular, somebody's monitoring, operating, fixing, and ensuring performance of the system. So there's that kind of third element here when we really stack everything up. It's financing, it's tax credit absorption, and it's ongoing responsibility for uh, operations, operations and maintenance of the, of the system. Uh, and particularly either for a big company that doesn't want to think of themselves as being in the power plant business uh, or a small customer who says, I just don't have the resource. You know, I mentioned the Humane Society, uh, you know, they don't want to be in the business of making sure their solar systems operate. They want to be in the business of giving great homes to, to dogs and cats. So everybody has their preferences and you have other customers. So, for example, I mentioned Walmarts, but we also did a lot of business with Costco's and Ikea's. Every Costco and IKEA system you see uh, is owned by that customer directly. They were very proficient at, they had plenty of federal tax appetite, uh, tax liability to absorb it against. It's one of our industry terms. We talk about tax appetite. It's just, are you paying federal income taxes you can take the credit against? Uh, and they were so focused on managing their energy usage, they wanted to own those systems and take the credit. They didn't want uh, a PPA. So, it's all functional. What customer preferences and requirements are we trying to solve from capital, tax credit, and ongoing system performance for, as we talked about, it's a 25-year asset, right? So the number of customers we've sat with, either the business owner or a nonprofit, we used to do a lot of, uh, still do a lot of houses of worship. And somebody says, look, I'm not going to be here when this thing is comes to the end of its useful life. Uh, so I don't want to be, I want to pass off to my next generation, whether the next owners of the company or the next custodians of the church or synagogue, I want to pass off to them a package, an asset that I know is performing and saving them money and that isn't a huge maintenance or technical headache for them. Uh, and so lots of customers also value that. And we can do that as part of the financing or you can still uh, kind of parse these out to the point where there are some, you know, anybody can clean a system. And the reality is PV systems work uh, properly. And but they also have, as with anything you put in, they also have technical issues. And so there are now companies like Omnidian uh, out there that will operate uh, and to some level kind of even ensure or guarantee uh, performance of your system. So you might say, hey, on this menu of things you've given me, I need capital and I want somebody to operate the system, but I'll take the tax credit. Okay, great. Boom, boom. Uh, I don't need the capital, but I'd love to monetize the tax credit and have somebody operate the system. Okay, boom, boom. We can do that. Or we can pull that all together with the PPA where we're financing tax credit and operating the system. So 
I and think we're going to break that out more in another session, but it's a good kind of overview concept to uh, to think about. So, this is this has been an excellent overview, James. I think uh, lot to lot to think about, lot to unpack here. Uh, excited. We're over the next couple episodes. Uh, we're going to be diving deeper into uh, general tax credits and and whether you purchase the system outright or you decide to finance it. Um, in, the, in the episode after that, we'll, we'll go a bit deeper into power purchase agreements and leasing. Um, and then after that, we'll, we'll go into to debt and pace. So uh, I think uh, there's there's a lot for people to, to think through. I think for many of our listeners, it can be a bit overwhelming. But uh, the beautiful thing is uh, there's companies like Painted Rock. There's companies like Vecta that can help them think through this and ultimately determine what's the best path for them to achieve what they're trying to achieve, to get their long-term financial outcomes that they're looking for um, and fit within the confines of their structure. So any other thoughts here before we wrap this particular episode, James? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm glad you said that because one of the things I want to highlight is on the one hand, you know, there is some complexity, particularly on the back end to financing that contractors in particularly need to be aware of and that customers should do their diligence on. But my objective is always to simplify this on the front end so that the key decision points uh, are understood right off the bat rather than buried on page 27, you know, yeah. of a 50 page deck. Uh, I'll also strive to do this in the first two or three minutes of each of our sessions, uh, because, you know, sometimes wading through the complexity detracts from people understanding the key point that they're at in the evaluation process. So I get that. And that's also why on our website, we try to break out uh, basics uh, for things instead of uh, I sort of view it as let's give people a kind of synopsis of information rather than making them comb through the Internet uh, to figure out all the questions that they should be asking us. Good one. All right. Well, uh, let's wrap up there. And next uh, episode, we'll talk about uh, general tax credits and purchasing uh, financing in, in a bit more detail. Thanks, guys. Cheers. You, James. We receive a lot of questions from business leaders around the world wanting to learn more about the energy transition, what is possible and where to start. So to help you stay informed and up to date on best practices, opportunities, risks, and success stories, we created an industry news feed at vector.com forward slash news with all our podcasts, blogs, and newsletter. Check it out and connect with Dan, myself, and the Vector team to learn more. Cheers and have a good one.